Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us this morning. What a few days we've had. It's exciting to be here back on the stage today. And we've got a real treat for you today because um, we're going to be discussing AI and the future of AI. Um, I don't know about you, but for me, it was always the stuff of sci-fi. But now we're finding increasingly it's integrated uh, into everyday life and a lot more so than I think we would probably realize. So to discuss how investments will drive the next wave of intelligent machines, I'd like to introduce our panel. Dr. Majid al Tawadri, CEO of the National Center for Artificial Intelligence at Saudi Data and AI Authority. Thank you for Thank joining you. us. Thanks. We have Antonio Simeone, founder of Euclid, algo trader and financial journalist. We have Pascal Weinberger, CEO and co-founder of Bardeen AI. And Michael Janis. Uh, now I can't, I'm going to have to struggle to pronounce your name. Let me get this right. Jan Janizowski. Very good. Oi, <laughs> got there. Chief Operating Officer, Asset Servicing and Digital at BNY Mellon. Thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, Dr. Majid, I wanted to begin with you and ask you, how will AI shape all aspects of business, work and life and leisure over the next decade? Thank you, Jane. And it's good to be here with the distinguished speakers. Uh, I think you said that's right, Jane. Uh, we, we use AI in our daily lives. I mean, when we wake up in the morning, uh, drive the car, uh, use GPS uh, or uh, driving assistance, this is all AI. Our kids at home play uh, games using AI. So uh, AI is already blended in our life, uh, more than w we think we do. But the future is going to be even exponential more. We will see that in every place where data makes sense. I think in, in areas like uh, healthcare, in uh, banking, in transportation, in many walks of life where data is really growing exponential, you will see AI also growing exponential. How do we measure? We talk about this big data, you know, Pascal, you know, what does that mean to you and how are things changing there? Yeah, I think when we uh, look at AI, we always have to look at it in the context of uh, how do we train such an algorithm. And um, for most commonly used machine learning techniques uh, like deep learning, um, recommendation engines, and so on that we you know, see and use in our daily lives today, uh, they all rely on uh, massive amounts of training data uh, in order for them to understand the underlying structures of that data, which they can then use to make predictions, make forecasts or recommendations, or depending on what the use case is. So I think as um, AI becomes increasingly important, obviously the quality and the amount of training data that we have available for us to train such algorithms also you know, increasingly becomes more and more important. Um, and then you know, currently there's this whole <coughs> movement uh, to contrast with that um, about you know, training ma algorithms with <coughs> small amounts of data. So like you know, what we call few shot learning, um, which is also uh, pretty interesting because there's a lot of applications that uh, we don't have a massive amount of training data for. You know, for example, for um, doing recognition on rare diseases. Um, obviously, <coughs> if a disease, a disease only occurs, you know, in zero point something percent of the population, we don't have massive amounts of training data to recognize it. So um, those are, I think, the two uh, distinct areas of machine learning that are both very important for um, distinct applications. What will the next generation of AI be capable of and what opportunities does that present? Um, it's very hard to tell, <laughs> um, obviously. Um, I think, and like what we're also working on, is uh, really trying to focus on this um, human-machine collaboration uh, idea of machine learning, which actually if you go back all the way to like Ada Lovelace and so on, like the, I think like inventors of the, the field of machine learning, they were describing this idea of um, very seamless interaction between computers and, and, and humans. Um, and that's also, I think, what this next generation of machine learning uh, hopefully focuses on, uh, where we can then essentially, instead of trying to replace human labor, we can try to make uh, humans and like workers more effective at what <coughs> they're doing. Uh, to try to essentially take all the you know, boring and annoying work uh, away from them so that we can really focus on the things that we're best at, um, that machines are currently not so good at. The cutting and pasting jobs. Yeah, essentially. That <laughs> <kind of laughs> I want to bring in at this point Antonio, <laughs> and you know, we, we talked a little backstage you know, about 
there is this concern that AI is going to replace us humans. It sounds like something out of a Terminator movie, you know, the machines are going to take mm. over. Um, <clears throat> is that really the case? I mean, the, a report from the World Economic Forum uh, estimated that AI was actually going to create 97 million jobs, new jobs, by 2025. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, I want to talk uh, about my experience mm -hmm. in the financial sector. So, um, we create uh, some structure, different uh, algos, that uh, replace, uh, I don't know, 500, 1,000 of financial traders or analysts. Um, in our case, uh, uh, I'm an algo trader, so we replace uh, uh, the work of, uh, of, uh, of a thousand traders, of the investment bank, uh, of the financial institutions. And uh, in, uh, in, one, in our algos, uh, in uh, one algo, uh, for example, uh, we can see we can see um, an historical data or pattern, micro pattern, <coughs> into a deeply way thanks to AI, and um, and uh, we 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 manage another another fund on biotech, uh, and uh, we are integrated uh, two different AI. So uh, one AI study analyzes the scientific paper, the team of research of the biotech, uh, molecules, etc. And this is a qualitative AI, and uh, we we are integrating uh, with uh, an AI quantitative. So uh, we are replaced uh, two different uh, two different sectors in the biotech and uh, in the in the financial in the financial industry. And um, probably yes, in the future, uh, algos uh, uh, probably uh, could replace uh, uh, many many humans. Okay, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you answered that right at the end, you <laughs> slipped that one in. I mean, I want to open that up to Michael. What are your thoughts on, you know, the, the job front, whether they're going to replace humans? Yeah, so I, I think the <laughs> phenomenon we're seeing, and if we're playing it forward 10, ten years, uh, is that AI, uh, we're, we're at a period now where it's, it's augmented intelligence, right? It's, it's person and then computer. Mm -hmm. I think we're quickly approaching person and computer, mm -hmm. which means the AI is uh, accomplishing human tasks either at or above a, a human threshold. And we're already seeing that in computer vision, in natural language processing, and other things. And what it means is that the, the j new jobs will be created, uh, but roles will have to change. And this idea of, of collaborating with a, with a technology partner in the same way that you would collaborate with a human partner mm -hmm. is something that we're going to see a lot more of. At the moment, though, it's a tool. What happens when it gets so intelligent that it can program itself? Well, it already does. <laughs> so so prog uh, programs around OpenAI and GPT-3 are, in fact, already creating code mm -hmm. to accomplish an outcome currently. And I think, so if I might jump in, this, like, there's also this idea of um, optimization algorithms that we've used since 20 years to optimize other machine learning algorithms. So if you will, then that's already like AI training AI, right? But um, I think uh, also to add on this other point that you mentioned, um, there's a lot of... Um, things that machines are really good at, that humans are really bad at. Like, if I asked you to look at, you know, 10 million medical records and identify the common pattern and then look at this, like, new patient and see if you can find this common pattern, like, no human physically even could accomplish such a task, but machines do it in seconds or milliseconds today. Um, but then on the other side, we are really good at doing things that computers are really bad at today. Um, like, you know, just asking a simple question, like, can an, uh, can an elephant play tennis? You know, like, every two, three-year-old child will, like, laugh a little bit and then say, like, no, of course not. Um, but for a computer to understand that, it's, it's actually, like, a pretty non-trivial task. And even the most advanced algorithms that we have today, like GPT-3 and so on, they're struggling. If you provide the right, the right context, then they will say, yes, of course, an elephant can play tennis, because maybe in the sentence before you gave it context of, you know, how that could work, and then they, they don't have this idea of common sense and common knowledge. So I think that's why this idea of collaboration will be really, really important, as you mentioned. So what kind of goals should we be providing AI with, and how important is that? That's a very interesting question. <laughs> I think... Um, Tricking you on the stage. You're under the... <laughs> I think um, so from an from a, uh, like idealistic standpoint, obviously, I think uh, what, uh, from what I know also, like most people are building these algorithms with a specific task in mind. Like 
even GPT-3, which arguably is the most human algorithm that we see today, like people are use it to have conversations as a chatbot and so on, um, or text generation, that's a uh, so-called autoregressive um, uh, sequence generation model. So it, like all it, it's trained to do is to predict the next token or word, if you will, uh, of a sequence of words that you provide it with, uh, which in itself is a pretty simplistic task, but then if you train it on trillions of sentences, uh, basically the whole internet, which you know, OpenAI team and Microsoft did there, um, <laughs> then you can see that it sort of understands the structures of language and you know, seems to have understood some common sense, but really what it's doing is just predicting the, the next token or the next sentence. Um, so I think it's really hard to think about setting like really common goals, you know, like we humans, arguably our goal is to, you know, evolution reproduce and, you know, gain social status and blah, blah, blah. That, that type of stuff is really hard to program into any kind of machine learning algorithm. And therefore I think it will take a pretty long time until we see, you know, arguably human behavior, like actually human behavior in machine learning. So, yeah. I think I want to direct this over to Dr. Majid as well. I mean, for you and your experience, you know, what companies and visionaries do you feel are driving the greatest advancements in AI and how have some of these been adopted here in the kingdom? Thank you. I think AI is, the good thing about AI is the time from lab to production is very short. So unlike other discipline where it takes years, I think now it takes months from an idea in a lab to be utilized in, in the real life. And I can uh, think of really AI as really o augmenting our intelligence. Uh, Humanity has been always striving for more intelligence. You know, with every invention, we want to be smarter as human beings. We want to be more efficient. And, and we've been always scared of new technologies. I mean, this is not new to AI, but to any, any advancement that the human being has taken, I think they've been scared about that. And I think AI, I can think of it as really augmenting our capability and smartness. today. When we look for rare disease that, that we want to find solution for, uh, our capacity as a human being to look for billions and billions of data in the genome and linking that with the clinical data in the hospital, linking that with the way we, 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 we have our consumer health informatics, the way we walk, the way we eat, it's really present a huge amount of data that we as human being have the capacity to solve. But then we invented AI to help us solve that problem. So I can think of AI as a way that we human created to make us smarter. And we shouldn't worry about that because we human has been always uh, created with this new unique features that we've been always able to be uh, adapting to the, to the environment. I mean, look at the COVID situation. In the first month, we were all panicking now we are living with it. This is the human being. So I feel that uh, really uh, we want to take advantage of that, not neglecting the risk. The risks are there, and risks has to be covered with the right governance. Healthcare is is a, is a, is an area we I believe can be disrupted with 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 AI, and I think we we see one of our doctors here with us today who invented, for example, using uh, AI for retinopathy and and really solving the blindness of diabetic patient, which is 30% of our population. Education, I feel it will be disrupted. Today, if you look at kids at school, studying five years of programming, the time they finish and graduate, that programming code is obsolete. So, so the way we learn has to be disrupted, and I feel AI. AI is there to make services more personalized. It's a personalized medicine, personalized education, personalized experience. You talked there and you touched on the fact, you know, how the pandemic was affected, but you know, <coughs> what came with that across all industries, I think was the acceleration of wanting knowledge. You know, how has the AI industry accelerated and can we keep up with it? Mike. So I, I think right now we're in the era of AI that supports two things. It's profound automation and decision support. So the, the, the virtue of the way AI works, look at it, very, very large data sets and either taking the burden of that analysis away or finding new things within the data is, is sort of where we are now. I think the next phase is maybe the, maybe the machine can make that decision for you. 
And that opens an entirely new set of decisions and considerations now that humans begin to give up agency on decisions, mm. right? And so if the machine is already determining superior outcomes and can deliver on those outcomes, you know, what comes next is maybe an interesting thing to debate. What comes next? <laughs> You're asking yeah. your own questions now. <laughs> well, look, roles, roles change, but also, you know, human consideration of AI changes, right? The, the outcome or the derivation of a data set by a machine mm. uh, might be different th than a human's conclusion over something. Ethics built into AI, uh, guardrails put into AI become real considerations in a world where a machine is performing at a superior level to a human in many cases. Bringing it back to a business perspective, you know, how can CEOs, uh, and maybe this one for you, Antonio, how can CEOs and policymakers ensure an ethical AI? <laughs> it's another question. <laughs> it's, another, it's another question because, um, you know, I'm, I'm a scientist, so um, I, I don't want to limit uh, the power of AI, okay? But, uh, but uh, I, I can understand uh, uh, this problem. I can understand uh, what, uh, what say, uh, a potential CEO asked me. And uh, probably I have to limit uh, something in the rules of the structure, of the algo structure. Um, I can, uh, I, I think, I think to, to create, I think, I think to create a bridge, uh, CEO and the scientist, and they work together for a new paradigm, for a new approach, because uh, we, we are, we are uh, publishing a paper, uh, etc. CEO uh, talks AI with, uh, in a narrative way, uh, the robots, uh, um, uh, the, the, uh, we will take out, etc., etc. Et so um, I think uh, we have to work together and we work uh, with uh, different AI and, uh, and with a partner there is a quantum, quantum computing and uh, quantum mechanics, etc. So a new framework, a new mathematical framework and uh, new AI, ethics and, uh, and the know. Not going on from that framework though, Pascal, you know, what intellectual <laughs> business and policy frameworks will be required to thrive in a world impacted by widespread AI? Again, a tough question. I think, um, <laughs> obviously, like, there's, I think, like, if you're gonna um, talk about AI, and we touched on this in the beginning of the conversation, we also have to talk about the training data we use to, um, you know, build and train, train such algorithms. And uh, I think that's probably where, if, if <coughs> I was in politics and I had, you know, all the uh, uh, contextual knowledge that would be required to make such a decision, I think I would start looking at uh, the training data and tr start to understand like what are things we can do on a policy level that will help ensure that the data is not biased, is not uh, uh, oversampled in a certain you know set of population. Like we see that I think like maybe you can talk more about this in, in, in credit scoring already. Famous example where uh, the um, essentially the postal code of the address of a person uh, was one of the key features to determine. Um, whether they are going to be credit worthy or not uh, based on the machine learning algorithm uh, and that obviously was correlated with their, you know, li do they live in a, uh, you know, western neighborhood or in a, you know, ghetto neighborhood and, 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 and those types of things I think we, ne we need to be really, really careful with um, to, to understand that now we, uh, we're operating on a very, very high di dimensional level where there's a lot of data and a lot of correlations that are taken into account that we sometimes just as like with our limited capacity in our human brains, we just cannot understand them. So we have to build the tools to make sure that at the data level that we use to build the algorithms, that we um, can correct for such biases and, 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 and such oversampling to make sure that like the resulting algorithms are gonna be, you know, at least somewhat fair. And if they're unfair, we have to understand in which way they are unfair so we can correct for it, again, in the human machine collaboration uh, idea. Um, and, and, and yeah, that's probably where I would start. Um, I would be very careful with trying to limit the use of AI because I think at the end of the day, uh, even if you look at self-driving cars, um, we have to measure with similar measuring sticks. You know, like when we demand a self-driving car to be 100% accident-free, that's it's kind of unfair because humans are not 100% accident-free. And I would rather have a 99.95% accident-free card and maybe, you know, might be a bad example here, but like maybe a drunk driver uh, who speeds with 150 miles an hour 
um, which obviously like they're going to be more dangerous than the 99.95% uh, correct algorithm. So I think that's also something that as policymakers we should be um, careful to not limit the use of algorithms too much where they can probably already be useful today but we don't use them. Okay. Well, we're joined on the stage. Um, late but you know better late than never with Bruno Messonnier, founder and CEO of Another Brain. You would think there would be some kind of AI technology to help you find your way around Saudi Arabia, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry for being late. I was in another. <laughs> I had a, a token. Don't worry. It's like it, it's so big. You need Google Maps in here. But welcome to the stage. Thank, Thank you, you so much for joining us, um, Bruno. Actually, good timing because we've just been talking there about principles and policies, and I wondered whether you think there needs to be, I guess, a global governance of AI as an offshoot of that. Is that difficult because people adopt it regionally very differently? Okay. Uh, when everyone is on the same line, that means uh, there is no value added. So some has to disagree. So I disagree with, <laughs> with this statement. Uh, not, not only for the game. Uh, I, I think there are, there are risks with AI uh, as well as there are risks with every new technology. You know, it's something that is happening all over the <coughs> humankind history. We brought fire and people died from fire. We brought uh, power, we brought uh, nuclear. We brought, so it, it happens. And each time we have the same reaction. First fear. And then we, we say, OK, let's, let's forget about it. We want the second phase. And the third phase is humankind is very good at putting the feedback, at learning from that, uh, at putting the rules and the constraints that will, that will make that we will get the positive out of these new technologies, new possibilities, and, and uh, minimize the negative part. The same will come with, with AI. I will come to that in, in one minute. But just before, the main question for me is, when do we have to have this governance? When do we have to have these rules? And think about that. If we had put rules, current rules on aviation planes in the early 20s, we never would have plane industry. If we had put rules on cars in the 90 uh, or something, we never would have car industry. So the question is, we need to put rules, but first we need to accept the Darwinian exploration of the different possibilities. And to accept people to explore, to try. And they will try good things, they will try bad things, and then afterwards we will control and we will put rules. So I'm always afraid, so this is my answer, about rules and, and global governance that are put on something uh, from, from uh, just a general thinking and just from the experience. And you know, it's something we are very good at. So I'm from France, I'm from Europe, and in Europe, uh, there is something strange. We are very good at ethics. We are having a lot of ethics committees. But the AI engine are done by American or Chinese. So that means it's like if we are, we are trying as a uh, water skier to orient the boots, so instead of doing that, let's create our boats. Uh, putting rules to orient the boat, but somebody else is driving the boats doesn't make any sense. So that for me, there is a question. Let's <coughs> accept exploration. Exploration is bringing some risk, yes, but we have to be very reactive and then to control that. So it would be my kind of my answer. You know, on, on moving again on from that, what are, the, what are the greatest challenges, I guess, and Dr. Majid, maybe you can answer, what are the greatest challenges in the development of AI, but then the integration of it? Uh, I think uh, we have to worry about, uh, I think countries have to worry about the data bias. Uh, now, the advancement of AI is happening uh, in the US, in China, and some parts of Europe. And, and when we try to adopt those algorithms and try to use them on local data, I think accuracy become a, a major issue. So, so I think we have to be very conscious about uh, the, the different types of data, the localization of data, the bias of data. Bias can be uh, against colors, the bias can be against race, or, so we have to worry about that. Uh, our uh, gene map in Saudi Arabia is completely different than the US and Europe. And, and if we think that the same medication that applies to Saudi is the same medication applies to another country, I think we, we are missing the point. So, so so this is where AI can help us to really, uh, again, find solution. Uh, 
I tend to agree that, that, that there is a need for uh, regulatory bodies to govern the use, to ensure that, that the use is also responsible use, uh, without really affecting the, 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 the research, and, uh, the, because I think it's very important also not to contain the thinking of researchers <coughs> to, to, to extend the limit for AI uh, and data. But I believe uh, also uh, within organizations, we have to make sure that, that uh, there is always a fit for purpose. So there is purpose for using AI, and, and AI is not going to be used for the sake of using AI, but if, if it is used to solve a problem or make us more efficient or reduce capacity. We have done, for example, a very nice project for breast cancer, and we are in the month of breast cancer. And, and with one of the charity organization where it used to take almost six months for a mammogram to be read by a doctor due to capacity, and this is voluntary job. Uh, with AI, you can do that in one minute. At least you can screen the, the cases that needs to be seen by a doctor and put them on, a, on a, an accelerator track and leave something else that can take six months. This is the beauty of AI. This is where we can make things faster, better, more efficient. But to, we have to be conscious that, that localization of AI is important. And this is where democratization of AI becomes an issue because Africa and other countries are not advancing in this field and, and, and they will be left over. So I think we have to look for really bringing everybody together. How do we do that? You know, this inclusiveness. And I think over the last 18 months to two years, it's been become very clear that the world genuinely is a smaller place. You know, how do we bring them on board with us? Fully agree. And, and I, think, I think it's all triggered by data. I mean, I mean, researchers in the West, if they know that there is a rare disease in Saudi Arabia that they cannot find data in, in Europe, they will come and, and collaborate. And similarly, I think we have to look for things that connect, connect us and, and because now we are thinking more as competition, who's going to you know, win this race. And, and I think we are missing a lot by doing that. Uh, I think here in, in Saudi Arabia, we, we started the, the, the AI uh, Global Summit. We tried to bring people together. We also organized a UN meeting just to bring also African countries to the picture. So every country has to do their part. And, and I think international bodies will, will play a major role. Bruno? I fully agree with part of what has been said, but the part is a question of time frame. <laughs> what we are doing, all of us today, in uh, speaking about or doing artificial intelligence is something that has no intelligence at all. It's statistics, let's say, another way of doing statistic categorization, and then Yes, my estimate colleague is absolutely right. Uh, the question of bias in the data is, uh, is, is key. And when we speak about color, let's say it's easy to discover, but there are other bias, much more hidden, very difficult to discover. So yes, he's absolutely right. Now, my question is, we need another way of doing artificial intelligence. We need really intelligent AI. And we begin to know how. For me, the time frame is it will begin in 22. 20 and 22 or under your after that means it's right now we begin to know how to do really intelligent ai working more or less like our brains and you know what our brains is not needing hundreds of millions of data to 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 make decision when you look at the movie uh, you have an alien you don't know how it looks like the first time you are surprised but the second time you recognize it mm -hmm. so our brain is able to learn immediately and very frugal in energy what is not the case of deep learning ai so that means Yes, uh, this problem of bias and data is absolutely key. They have to be localized in the current way of doing AI. But there is another way of doing AI. And in my view, this other way is coming very soon. And small companies, small countries, or left behind countries in terms of technology are able to overpass the giants because it's no more a question of thousands of PhDs or billions of dollars. It's a question of another kind of mindset and it's a question of uh, doing all the way around. So here's a question of ID and I'm deeply convinced that the winner, cards will be shaken. The winner of tomorrow, when I say tomorrow it will be in two, three years time, it's not in uh, uh, 10 years time, may come from whichever country around the world. It's not a question of 
of PhDs and, and, uh, and a top-down mindset. On the opposite, we want a bottom-up mindset, which is totally different. <coughs> I mean, Pascal, I'd like to bring you in here. How do we conceptualize and create intelligence then? How do we make it? That's a tough question. I think it's uh, the holy grail of uh, AI right now. Is to, I mean, and you have the there's, answer. There's, I don't. Uh, I, I don't think I do. But um, I think there's a, a lot of very promising approaches. And um, one thing that like w w we are particularly spending time with is this idea of neurosymbolic machine learning. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a, a, a almost forgotten field in machine learning where people try to um, essentially symbolize, if you will, the world, and then you try to learn the relationships between symbols, um, and then, you know, great advances like, you know, the <coughs> famous IBM Watson uh, uh, example and so on came out of this field that required a lot of human input, a lot of manual work, if you will, to define these relationships and so on. And then on the other side, in the recent years, we have this end-to-end -end trained machine learning approaches, namely deep learning and other techniques, uh, where you essentially don't require any human input at all. Um, and, and you just give it, you know, millions or hundreds of thousands of examples of something, which totally on board with what Bruno said, that, you know, that's clearly not how we learn as, as, as humans. Um, but, but there's something in the middle where you're trying to uh, essentially learn relationships between concrete objects or things uh, that you represent from the real world. And you learn these relationships not necessarily through... Uh, programming, so human input, but you learn them through then like end-to-end -end deep learning. And, and the combination of those has already shown very promising results um, where you can uh, uh, solve pretty complex cognitive tasks with relatively small amounts of training data. Uh, example in computer vision, for example, there's um, um, already out there open sourced algorithms where you show it uh, a handful, say like two to five, maybe ten examples of a completely new object that the algorithm has never seen before. And now we can distinctly uh, recognize that object with a fairly high accuracy. So that, that behavior then becomes more comparable with what we know from you know, the example Bruno described of how we humans learn. Yeah. Um, so I think there are already promising examples. Um, obviously, there's a lot more work to do, and I completely agree that the, uh, most of the resources that we see today being put in the field are still, unfortunately, being poured into this uh, you know, pure field of deep learning, uh, billions of dollars in computing power. Most of the research uh, being published today is, I think, 95-ish percent uh, on, on this deep learning field, and very incremental changes to that. Um, but the problem there is obviously that works so well right now that uh, you know, it's, it's almost like a, 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 a dilemma where it still works too well not to keep funding it, and it still solves a lot of problems extremely well, uh, which is why obviously big companies are funding it. Uh, and then on the other side, it's more of a niche field right now with this new symbolic approaches and some other ideas that maybe are currently being explored. Right maybe now. just building on the point, right? It feels like the way forward in many ways for AI is increasingly human. So mm -hmm. the challenge is historically with AI, it's a black box. Right? It's not explainable, uh, and there are a number of other factors. It doesn't think the way that a human does, even though we, we do model a lot of it. We have neural nets, we have transformers, we have other techniques that we apply. But the, the state of the art is moving very quickly towards emulating more of what neuroscience does in our own brains. When we talk about sparse networks, right? when we talk about dendrite theory and applying that to the way that we develop our algorithms, we're actually building more along the lines of, lines of a brain than a machine mm -hmm. over time. I think when you start doing that, we start emulating more of people, and that might be the way to intelligence. I think, like, uh, so, sorry to jump in, but a th more philosophical question here, but um, a lot of people always try to build machines that work like humans. We already have more than 7 billion humans on this planet. It's like, why would we build more of them? <laughs> I think most of machine learning we see today is being used to solve very, very specific problems, and there's obviously this famous example of, like, a watch, you know, like a human... Uh, it's, it's a pretty bad machine for telling time. Like, I have no idea how, I mean, unless I watch, look at the watch the, in, in the background, I have no idea how long we've been sitting here. Uh, but watches are extremely good at it. Um, and, and there's a lot of very small problems that we can already solve with the existing uh, techniques. Why would we spend time creating another, like, human-like uh, algorithm that just works, you know, same the same way? Yeah, then it's like we already have, you know, again, 7 billion plus humans that want to do work, need to do work, and so on. So it's, I think it's a quite philosophic question, like do we actually need to build machines that work like a brain do? But so what is the end goal then? 
Uh, that's a tough question. That is a, I think it depends on every individual. There's some people who are driven by curiosity to try to replicate how the brain works uh, largely, I think, in order to understand how the brain works with you know huge projects like the Blue Brain Project and so on. Um, and then on the other side, there's more pragmatic, mostly driven by the large companies, more pragmatic approaches where you have a very specific problem to solve, like what movie do I recommend the person next, like, you know, that type of stuff. So, yeah, I think the end goal depends on who the actor is. Uh, personally, for me, my end goal is really to understand how we can make people more effective at what they're doing by providing them tools that don't have to work like our brains do, but I think our work in the exact orthogonal way where they're really good at the things that we are not good at and they don't need to be good at the things that we're good at. So if you combine those two, you have a pretty powerful machine. Well, Michael, you touched on the neuroscience of it and obviously, you know, we are the ones ultimately that are creating this technology. You know, what more needs to be learned from and developed by studying neuroscience to shape the future of AI? No, I, I think the understanding of the brain is reflected actually in, in the implementation in AI presently. And the, the short of it is we, we don't fully understand cognition. We don't fully understand the neuroscience behind how we, how we get to decisions. And frankly, the things we implement, and it's no surprise, reflect that. Mm -hmm. right? But the, I, and I, it highlights the importance of continuing to learn more about how we work and looking for inspiration in places like us and in nature for, for building that into technology in the future. Yeah, we don't know. We don't know how it works, uh, yeah. our brain. So it's uh, difficult to, to study and uh, simulate the brain. And uh, <laughs> I think uh, you 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 are agree with me, Bruno. Uh, we don't know how it works. We don't know everything. Of course, there are a lot of things we don't know, but we know things. We don't know nothing. There are things we know, and for me, what we have is good enough to create the basis. And I will give you some examples, uh, maybe out of that. But it's very important to understand that what everyone is doing, machine learning, deep learning, AI, and so on and so forth, it came from kind of a discrepancy, a, a discussion in the early 80s between people saying, wow, we have super powerful, powerful computers, algorithm, wow, to try and understand the messiness of the brain to create AI. That means if we want to, to fly planes, we are not uh, mimicking the birds. Mm -hmm. So let's go our way. And this created uh, all the computer science to, of today and AI of today. But the question is, it got some limits. And you know what? Five years from now, five years ago, sorry, uh, we all heard about autonomous vehicle. It was the main themes. Everyone was speaking about autonomous vehicle. And now, nobody more. Why? Because the fundamentals of AI is that you have to feed the system with all the situations it will encounter during its life. So you have to feed for an autonomous vehicle the, your car with 100% of the situations the car will be confronted to during its life, which is impossible. So when people understood that, then they said, wow, so we have to invent a new way of doing artificial intelligence. So it will take 30 years. So that's why even Chris Jormson, the CEO of Google Cars, said, okay, autonomous vehicle now, it's not for now, it's in 30 to 50 years. But the real question behind it, we had to invent a new AI. But fortunately, I agree with all you said in terms of uh, constraints in terms of interest, we have references. I'm sorry, we have the human brain, okay? But we have mammal's brain, we have bird's brain, and we have social bugs. And I will give you some hints from social bugs, because people don't think that we can learn from honeybees, but we can. If you take honeybees, uh, the, you take a hive of honeybees, end of winter, uh, they are crowdy uh, because they produce new eggs and new, 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 new bees. So 10,000 of them decide to leave and to create a new hive. And they have to choose the best place to create a new hive. That means finding the places and comparing the places. So it's a very complex cognitive challenge. None of the honeybee is able to make decision and to make a comparison. They don't have brain for that. So how are they doing? They are all loaded with very elementary behaviors and all of them all have the same behaviors. And here you see the, the power of the emergent process. That means the result, which is a high level cognitive task, is coming from uh, a combination of 10,000 of honeybees doing the very same thing with the same, but it making emerging um, this, this result. 
The same that termites, even more, more primitive bugs than honeybees, uh, they are able, these small termites, to create termite mounds that are air conditioned without any power. It can be up to 12 degrees difference between outside. So 40 degrees outside, 28 inside without energy. Wow. Uh, speed of the air is controlled internally. Humidity is controlled. But it's not controlled in an average rate. No. There are rooms with higher humidity because there are growing fungus they are eating. And there are other rooms with lower humidity rates because it's where they are nesting. So that means the power of emergence is great. And nature is very good at that. And you know what? If we look at the brain, the cortex, the neocortex, we have the same elementary structures equivalent to termites or honeybees. We have cortical columns, 110 neurons connected together. We don't know which kind of neurons. We don't know how, we don't know how they are connected. What we know is this very same structure is repeated 150 million times all over the cortex. So the, the brain is working like a multi-agent system. It's working the same way. It's like uh, swarm intelligence. Sorry? Yes, swarm exactly. Intelligence, yeah. So that means collective swarm different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's em emerging. It's emerging intelligence. So we know things. And there are hundreds of scientific publications about different aspects of the brain. Uh, of course, uh, even Nobel Prizes. But of course, it's difficult because they are lost among millions of publications around deep learning, machine learning, reinforcement learning, whatever. So you have to have a guideline. You have to know what you're looking for. But we have the basis for that. I think there's just such a vast, you know, like you say, it, it's so big and everything is coming at us so quickly. If we bring it back down to a business level, and this one for you, Michael, you know, how important is all of this to a business transformation? Well, from the, the perspective of, of BNY Mellon and with colleagues in financial services, uh, AI is essential and can add value to virtually any part of what we do, mm -hmm. uh, whether it be uh, trade management, whether it be interactions with clients, whether it be risk management. There are very few places that we wouldn't uh, do better for the benefit of, if you like, an electronic colleague that never forgets, can look at massive bits of data, can draw very interesting insights and conclusions, and do it faster than a human can. Right? You think of that as some of the benefits, the uh, naive benefits that an AI or an ML can provide. Uh, that helps us with investment research. It helps us automate just about anything that a person is doing in the operations space. It helps us look for fraud and intelligent in different ways, or not even uh, intelligent ways, just the fact that I know what normal looks like in a, in a computer's mind, and, and it can find something different. That's, that's a profoundly different approach to the way business has been conducted in financial services historically. And so that's really what's exciting and interesting and appetizing about really applying this in as many places as we can. How big a threat is cybersecurity to the AI industry? So I'll, I'll start, and I'm sure there are other opinions. <laughs> I'm sure right? everyone's but, uh, in. <laughs> look, I, what we're finding, right, is is not not ironically, the, the cyber defense on AI yeah. is more AI. Yeah. When you look at smart cities, uh, Las Vegas in, in the U.S. has uh, arguably a very smart city with a lot of uh, planning and, and algorithms running running the show. Uh, cyber defense was, and the cyber attacks have been, it feels very vogue on a global basis lately. They're protecting themselves with AI. Mm -hmm. They're looking for unusual anomalous events, and the AI is directing the response, right? So the agency of the response is actually being handed off to technology as well as finding uh, Facing issues. Facing itself. Yes. Bruno, I'm sure you've got something to add into this. I, I'm not expert in, uh, in that, so I, I just, uh, I'm just thinking with my uh, a good sense, uh, <laughs> let's say. Uh, if, uh, for me, the real AI, a really intelligent AI is something that will help us discovering new, new patterns, discovering new tactical schemes in situations. And uh, the others who will make attacks, so either for real defense we need or for uh, uh, virtual defense or whatever, uh, the other knows which kind of technology you have. It knows which kind of artificial intelligence you have. So they will build the attacks based on that. So that means you absolutely need to have a system for your defense that is not working the same way, and that is learning by itself. When you have, uh, when you have uh, satellites, uh, they are very, let's say, alone over there. And when you have satellites attacking them, well, they need to be able to react by their own. 
to a situation that is unknown each time different and so on. So, so for me, we really need real AI in order to do that. Uh, but with the same AI than everybody, you are on the opposite exposing yourself. Dr. Madja, do you think there will ever come a point when the AI technology becomes too clever? Yes, I, I think so, but not more clever than human. I think <laughs> it's at the end it's created by human. Uh, you know, these technologies we are talking about today, it's been there for many years. I, I did my PhD in the 90s, early 90s, using neural networks. Same technology applies today. What differs is data and more powerful machines. And the usage, the, the innovation that is brought by human that say, wow, this is a great tool that I can use in healthcare, I can use in smart city. You know, when we invented cars, the cities look different than before cars and after cars. And I think cities will be different before AI and after AI. And this is where Saudi Arabia invented NEO, because we believe cities of the future will be different with these technologies, with AI and, and you know, helping and the traffic control, public safety, cars might be different, the, the areas of drones might be different. So I think, yes, there will be smarter uh, AI and technologies. And I'm not sure how our kids would react to that. So, so there is this age divide that, that we have to worry about. We, we am in an age that I'm also limited in my thinking capacity to what AI can bring to, to, to life. But if I speak to my kid who's playing maybe hours a day on, on games that uses AI, might have a different thinking. So I, I wouldn't be surprised in the future where our kids each creating its own copy of himself as an avatar, you know, working with him day and night, be trained by him. By the time it gets old, it's another copy of, of him. So, so that is that what's ma what worries me, is we become not too human. And, and that's really us not using the technology in the right way. We talked earlier a bit about big data and the collective collection of data you know can become a big issue especially when it comes to privacy and data laws and I know two data laws have just been passed here in the kingdom how important is it to safeguard information that the AI technology I think it's very important uh, the, the fact that I mean if, if if I ask anyone to give me his or her ID they will be reluctant mm. but we are giving our data on, 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 a, on a just, just when, we, when you log into the internet, you're just giving away yourself, your personality, your interest, what you like to, to shop for, what you like to watch for, all of this is given for free. And companies are using that to create these big algorithms to know who we are so that they will direct marketing back to us. So I think this, this area of protecting our data is, is very important. And this is, again, unfortunately, this is really controlled by big companies in, in the world. And that's the worry of, of AI. The worry is the, the companies that are controlling AI that is using the data of people to really, uh, for their interest. So that, that's really very important. This is why Saudi Arabia has come up with policy for data protection. The same way we came up with policy for open data and for data sharing. So we don't want to prevent research and innovation, but at the same time, we want to do it in a responsible way. Pascal, what would you say has been, you know, what is the most immediate challenge for the industry? Uh, which industry? I mean, the, the AI, AI oh, okay. industry. <laughs> I think. I mean, I, I don't, I couldn't think of like one single one, but I think there's a multitude of them. I think first of all is this what, what was touched upon the, uh, how do you deal with data responsibly in a way that you don't limit uh, research, but at the same time don't intrude privacy too much and what's the trade-off yeah. there. I think this divide of what, where do we spend our time and energy in terms of research, what approaches, again, we talked about uh, neurosymbolic, emergent machine learning approaches versus deep learning and so on. I think that's a big challenge right now where, uh, you know, just we're running with like full speed against, you know, probably a concrete wall with deep learning. And uh, right now it's still fun to run in that direction, but at some point it might not be anymore. So I think doing that 
trade-off is going to be important. And then also this whole idea of human-machine interaction, like how are we going to um, uh, how are we going to make sure that um, we don't fully replace ourselves? We don't uh, we we use it as a, you know as it was designed originally as a tool to make ourselves uh, more effective and better at what we're doing. I think those are the m major challenges. There's obviously a lot more interesting stuff in terms of um, you know how can we um, we talked about security before. Uh, one thing that uh, is something that I spend a, a bunch of time on is this idea of how can machine learning algorithms be hacked. So now you're relying on, for example, computer vision for self-driving cars and those computer vision algorithms. They are recognizing very minute patterns uh, for something that, uh, uh, you know, in the end turns out to be, say, a stop sign or a person. And um, you can essentially f put like a filter, if you will, in front of the camera or the system that inputs the, uh, the, the images so that for a human it still looks like, say, a stop sign, uh, but for a machine it can now look like a green uh, traffic light. And uh, those types of adversarial attacks is something that uh, can become pretty uh, dangerous for, for the whole field of machine learning. Computer vision is just one example, but I think that's going to be really interesting to follow and see if we can come come up with good uh, policies to prevent it and also algorithms to identify and counteract such attacks. Bruno, I think you have something to add into that discussion. Yeah, uh, for, for the AI industry, during this phase where deep learning is, uh, is driving AI and it will happen for some years, <coughs> for me there is a problem that we have to face is that usually you don't have data, you don't have big data. That means when you have big data, you have a lot of challenges, a lot of problems of, of, uh, of secrecy, privacy, or whatever, and BS, whatever. But in the majority of the cases, you don't have the data. I will give you an example. Uh, we are working in my company with, with industry uh, uh, doing inspection. At the end of a production line, you want to control whether the, the product is correct or not. Uh, but industry or manufacturer want to improve, but they are not totally bad. So that means today they have a problem every 100,000 parts and they want to go to one per million. Okay, great, but one problem per 100,000 parts, you, you never will have thousands of problems registered as data to be able to run your deep learning AI. That means the problem is you don't have the data. When you will have uh, 1,000 or 10,000 of your examples of defaults, your, your production batch will be over. Uh, you know, and in the majority of the cases, the situation is we don't have the data. Uh, if you want to, to go to look for uh, extras, extrasolar planets, planets running around the other stars, if you want to go even for things like um, uh, radiology uh, on uh, uh, prothesis, somebody that has a uh, hip prothesis or knee prothesis, you want, you want to use AI to automatically learn and help radiology, you don't have the databases. That means in majority of real cases, you don't have the big data in order to do that. So this is something we have to deal with. There seems to be, in, I mean, there is infinite potentials on how we use AI. And it was something I said to Pascal earlier about, you know, what <coughs> is the end game? You weren't here for that, but what are your thoughts on that? The end game of AI, where is it going? Where does it end? There are so many things to say here. Uh, for me, uh, every sector of, uh, of, of humanity, of what we are doing, will be boosted by AI. And I will take some examples at the big level. Environment. Everybody knows for 20 years that we are going for huge problems. Everybody knows for 20 years. Even president of the United States, previous one or the other, they knew. But the question, we are not going fast enough. Why? Because it's tough, it's very difficult. Because you have to take into account so many constraints, so many uh, uh, things, people, wealthiness, and whatever. So it's very complicated. So for me, we need additional intelligence to help solving this question. But it's the same with something that that touched me because I have a daughter where, well, okay, uh, it's a genetic, uh, genetic engineering to solve diseases. That means we speak about that for 50 years, the same, but it's not yet there. Okay, we, we make, we've made some steps, we are moving ahead, great, perfect, but it's not yet there. It's so tough, difficult, 
So for me, there are huge problems of humankind that we will be able to solve, uh, help with additional artificial intelligence, but real intelligence. So for me, it will touch every area of humankind. And you know what? One day, we even will meet alien. I'm sure one day we will meet alien, but you know what? They won't live at the same frequencies as us. Maybe they will speak and talk and behave at uh, uh, 10 kilohertz, so we, you, don't even, you won't even see them. Or on the opposite, they will take uh, two years to make a sentence in the space. Or they will live in other frequencies, you cannot see them, they are in the UV. Or, so we will meet aliens. I'm sure artificial intelligence will be the only way to help humankind to deal with that positive. So there are so many things. The space business. Uh, digging uh, meteorites to produce uh, <coughs> cleanly uh, r rare metals or to produce clearly, uh, cleanly uh, different things will be great, but we will need AI for that, so it will transform humankind. Michael, uh, what, what do you think is the biggest thing, we, thing we've learned so far moving forwards? I think from the, the perspective of, of what AI can do relative to maybe another, a number of the waves of technology we've seen, is this, this one is truly unbounded, right? So any time we, we seem to have hit a limitation in what we thought an algorithm can do, someone finds a way and we break through and, and we're able to do more. We're able to do more and as, as was described, with, with less data, more intelligently, faster, and there's, it's, it's geometric at this point. And so that's, you know, I, I, I can't think of many technology analogs that have produced maybe that profound a change or has the potential to pr produce the profound change. And you, you don't use the word too often, e except maybe at conferences like this, to humanity than, than what AI has been able to accomplish across virtually every industry. How do we convince those who are reluctant to embrace it that this is the way forward? Oh, now that's, that's a tough question. Look, I, I think it starts, starts with experience, right? So <laughs> people are experiencing AI every single day to improve their lives, yeah. right? It starts with autocorrect on the iPhone, <laughs> right? It starts with that excellent match on, on a dating app uh, or, or something else. You, you're experiencing it day to day and you're actually using it, you don't know you're using it. Uh, and now the use cases are going to expand. I mean, how many of us have, sa have said, hey Siri, or okay Google, or, or pick, pick your permutation, right? We're training people to become more familiar with AI. Mm. And we're training them to be more comfortable with the results. And I think that's how it starts, right? It'll be bit by bit, and we'll, we'll all be users of AI in a big way uh, in the future. Even more so. Yeah, I think it's a, you're right. It's a tough question, but it's a question through which humankind passed several times. Humankind is very good at discovering new technologies. Each time people are reacting by fear, Let's think about steam, let's think about uh, nuclear power, let's think about electricity. People are fearing what's going to happen with that. Each time, but each time humankind has been able to, to close the loop and to put feedback loops and to, to take the good part of this technology, avoiding, reducing the dramatic uh, negative part effect. Look at the fire. How many people in human history dead, they died from fire? That mean, but now we know how to deal with that and we take the good part and not the bad. So it's something humankind is very good at. It will happen with AI, it will happen with robotics, it will happen with genetic engineering. We will have problems, we will have bad parts, and we will have good parts, and we will learn how to deal with, and we will, it will be only for, it will be much more for the good than for the, the bad. I don't know how we will do that, but it's something humankind is very good at. Gentlemen, thank you so much for a wonderful session this morning. Dr. Majid, Antonio, Bruno, Pascal, and Michael. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.